Coming up next on Futures in Biotech, we speak to the man who inspired Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 67, Triceratoping Egg Mountain. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would be way to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapeutic? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might be rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun's the center of the universe, so oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier. Today, we're going to go back in time, uh, a long time. Uh, rather than be Futures of Biotech, we're going to be the past of biotech. Um, our guest is the curator uh, of the Museum of the Rockies uh, and a professor at Mont uh, Montana State University. Um, he is a paleontologist. Um, interestingly, he discovered the first dinosaur eggs in the Western Hemisphere first evidence of dinosaur uh, colonial nesting, first evidence of parental care among dinosaurs, and the first dinosaur embryos. Um, he's written over 50 professional papers, 25 popular articles, uh, uh, co-authored six uh, popular books, co-edited co uh, uh, one technical book. And really interestingly, he was a technical advisor to Steven Spielberg during the making of Jurassic Park and its sequel, The Lost World. Uh, he also advised uh, director uh, Joe Johnston on Jurassic Park 3, three movies that I loved and sort of brought a incredible uh, story of, 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 of life history back into the, into society. It was, it was pretty amazing uh, stories and, and they were uh, very well told and, and thank God, uh, you know, well, in large part for, uh, due to our guest, his name is uh, Dr. Uh, Jack Horner. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let me ask you <laughs> the first question. Now, as a molecular biologist, when I think about DNA, I, I visualize the DNA. When I look at, think about a gene structure um, or a protein, I can, I can visualize it. You know, this is part of the best way to understand it is to be able to visualize it. Physicists, when they look at equations or they think about a theorem or um, sort of the a, a rule of nature, they, they can see the equation in their mind. They can, they can, it's very, very tangible. My question to you as a paleontologist, when you find a toe or a stone uh, that might be a piece <laughs> of a dinosaur, do you see that dinosaur? Does it all of a sudden hit you with great impact? Uh, I, I, I guess so. I mean, I, not when I find a stone, but <laughs> when, I find, when I find a, a bone of a dinosaur that I recognize, if, you know, if it is a, a toe bone of something that I know, like a Tyrannosaurus rex, yeah, I... I, when I'm picking it up, I certainly am imagining the animal. Wow. So you must uh, be able to travel in time in your mind and, and sort of get a sense of the greater context that this dinosaur was in. Well, I would, I would guess that, uh, you know, I can imagine a Tyrannosaurus a whole lot easier than you can imagine a strand of DNA. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, DNA is a little simple little double helix and uh, the genes start with ATG, right? It's pretty straightforward. Um, but a dinosaur is, requires a lot more extension to your, to your, uh, to, and, and so and l let me ask you, okay, how, let's start with how did you start uh, off uh, your career in paleontology? How does one well, become a paleontologist? I actually, I was, I, I think I was kind of born this way. I wanted to be a paleontologist my entire life. Um, I found my first dinosaur fossil when I was eight. I found my first dinosaur skeleton when I was 13. Um, I've been, I'd say I've been a, an, either an amateur or a professional paleontologist my entire life. Were you looking? 
What do you mean? Looking? When you were, when you were eight years old, were you out on Kelly's Island in Lake Erie, and all of a sudden <laughs> a bone sticks out? How did how did you come around that first dinosaur? If you could tell us well, about that first discovery. <laughs> my my father uh, was a sand and gravel man. He had a big gravel pit, so he was a little bit of a geologist himself, and. Uh, he remembered when he was a young man riding, he had a ranch in western Montana, and he was riding his horse across the prepper, his, his land, and saw some big bones sticking out <laughs> and <laughs> out of the rock. And, and that's just really what happens. I mean, uh, um, when we go out looking for dinosaur bones, they are literally sticking out of the rocks, sticking out of the dirt. I mean, they're real easy to find once you know what you're looking for. So at the age of eight, um, yes, I just, my father took, <laughs> my father took me out to his old ranch and I walked around and found some dinosaur bones. Is this unique to Montana and to a handful of places in North America or can you go pretty much anywhere in North America and look for specific, uh, dinosaurs? Well, um, dinosaurs are found where the right age rock is exposed at the surface of the ground. So dinosaurs lived, you know, from... 240 million years ago until 65 million years ago. And so anywhere you can go where that age rock is exposed to the surface of the ground, you can find them. But you can't go to Michigan. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of states that just don't have the right age rock exposed at the surface. Michigan, the, old, the, the rocks underneath all the gravel um, are too old. And okay. the gravel made by the gravel that was deposited by the glaciers is too young. Um, where are you right now? We're in Cleveland. Um, wow. And Cle uh, I've Cleveland, got a trilobite. Cleveland yeah. is a great... Now, see, you can't find a dinosaur in Cleveland, but you can find some really great fossil fish. So, um, you know, if you're looking for animals, fossil animals that are... You know, maybe 300 million years old, you're in a good spot. But if you're looking for dinosaurs, T-Rexes, that are 65 million years old, you're in the wrong spot. Okay, so I'm taking notes here. So if I go down to Tinker's Creek where there's this erosion, very uh, uh, deep <laughs> crevice uh, dug by uh, Tinker's Creek, it, it exposed all kinds of sandstone. I should be in a good shape there to find some stuff, right? No, if it's, I don't think there's anywhere in Ohio you can find uh, dinosaur age rocks. Uh, oh, this you could, it, you yeah. could if you go to Pennsylvania. Um, okay. There are some, there are some <laughs> sediments in Pennsylvania, and there are, there really aren't many in the middle. You know what we'd call the Midwest. I mean, it's just okay. I, that's. I don't live there. That's, you know, <laughs> if a person, person's looking for dinosaurs, you come out west. Montana. Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. Yep. Wow. Um, so, was you started at eight, you found your first bone sticking out. Um, your first full skeleton or first skeleton when you were 13? It was a, uh, about 50% complete skeleton mm -hmm. of a duckbill dinosaur. Duckbill. Yep. What are duckbills doing in Montana? <laughs> <laughs> well, right right now they're just dead. <laughs> right. Oh. But, six, <laughs> but sixty five million years ago, they were wandering around looking for something to eat. Okay. So, well, let, before we get into sort of the the biology of these dinosaurs, right? Um, I still want to figure out how one you know goes out and searches. What what do you how do you prepare for it? What are you looking for? Do you go out looking for one dinosaur or another? You know. So tell me a little bit about. Uh, your, your current research projects or, you, or do your research projects kind of fall in your lap when somebody brings and says, I found this over there? Well, I send out uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 people during the summer. And so we do go out looking for specific things. Uh, last summer and in fact, over the last 12 years, we've been looking for looking in 65 million year old rocks uh, for Triceratops and T-Rex and other dinosaurs that particular age, really uh, to find a dinosaur is pretty simple. I, basically, you get your geological map that shows where different age rocks are exposed at the surface of the ground. And then you, uh, you know, you get in your pickup truck and you go there. And then you get out of your pickup truck and you 
literally walk around with your head down, you know, just like you're looking for money on the street. And, uh, and if you're lucky, you'll find a dinosaur bone. That must be a hell of a thrill to, <laughs> to be walking on the ground <laughs> that is 65 million years old and then to, to really cross paths with a dinosaur, especially if you've, you've got a strong sense of their biology and their life. So when you see a, a how, how do you build a story? How, how do you, so you find a duck bill. Uh, at that time, you know, what did you do? Did you dig it out of the ground? Did you, did you call in some paleontologists to help you? Because uh, at that time, I guess you're 13 years old. Uh, you know, you've got a pick and shovel. <laughs> not a whole lot of <laughs> well, training. When I, I was 13, might... <laughs> when I was 13, I, when I found it, I, uh, I excavated it for a science project, uh, which I presented when I was a senior in high school, when I was 17. And um, did very well on my science project. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, here's a duck bill. Um, so <laughs> what kind of condition was the, were the bones in? Maybe you could tell us what the, what the bones really are. Because, you know, we just think they're bones, but how do they last 65 million years? Well, you know, bone is, is calcium phosphate or, you know, um, hydroxylapatite. I mean, it's, it is, you know, it's, it's a mineral. And so... Um, it will break down over time if you just leave it on the surface. But if you cover it up, you know, cover it with sediment and leave it covered up for a long time, it will preserve. And it will go through a process called permineralization, where once the uh, soft tissues rot out of it, out of the vessels and all that stuff are gone, then a lot of that empty space is filled by, by another mineral, um, calcium or, or silica or something like that, which helps, you know, to uh, preserve it as well. That doesn't have to happen, for as you probably already know, um, we do actually preserve soft tissues occasionally under certain really? circumstances. Yes. How far back can you go with soft tissue? Well, we've gone... Uh, Close to 80 million so far. Wait, that puts us between the 240 and 65. <laughs> yeah, yes, it does. <laughs> awesome. Are we talking plant or are we talking um, beast? Beast. We've got uh, we've uh, one of my uh, former students, Mary Schweitzer, has successfully extracted um, blood vessels, um, cellular structures, Heme um, and collagen, the protein, mm -hmm. from from a sixty five million year old dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex. Wow! I have you sequenced the proteins? Was there enough to sequence? Could you th throw it on a mass no. spec? No, no, it's it. It appears to be collagen. That's about all we know. Okay. Any DNA? No. None whatsoever. I don't think that molecule lasts that long. Oh, man. <laughs> that would be a fun one. Um, not even well, a number? No, no, no. Mosquito? No, it's just... As you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm there's, there's, just, there's, a, there's a better way to do it. If you're okay. going to make a dinosaur, obviously there's a much better way to do it. How would you do it? Well, you would start with a bird. Okay. Which is, which is the dinosaur's descendant. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs gave rise to birds. So, so you know, we had birds. we had David Hosler who um, was wanted to do genome 10K, which meant uh, sequencing the genomes of 10,000 uh, mammals. And I suspect if you extend it, I think it was mammals. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> but then he wanted to, to extend it. I mean, I, I think it was plausible to extend it to birds as well. And look at the ancestral history uh, through the conserv conservation of what the, 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 you, the, the genome that was uh, common to all. Um, do you think that would take us back to, uh, I suppose it's very, um, uh, it's not a very tangible really way to do this, but I, I suppose if, could you make a consensus sequence for, for a dinosaur by taking the genomes of all the dinosaurs that have ever lived, uh, all the birds that are currently alive and go to the common ancestor? Would that no, take you that far well, back? Yeah. Well, that, that, 
that I think would give us a primitive bird. But, but you know, there's just <laughs> dinosaurs. Technically, our bird uh, birds are technically dinosaurs. So you really don't have to do anything to make a dinosaur because we already have them. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but you know, aesthetically, they don't look like you know. You look at a chicken, and it doesn't look like a velociraptor. But as we all know, all of us carry um, ancestral genes, and every once in a while they pop out as an atavism. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, a human is born with a tail because our because the ancestral trait is still there, the gene's still there. Every once in a while, it kicks on. Mm -hmm. um, the same goes for birds. Birds, every once in a while, are hatch out with a with a tail, just like we do. Every once in a while, um, and in fact, we 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 use one of them uh, rare as hen's teeth. Every once in a while, chickens are born with teeth. Wow. Every once every once in a while, birds come out with clawed hands. Uh, so, really, in order to make a dinosaur or to make something that looks like a ancient dinosaur, all we have to do is turn on those ancestral genes. In other words, find them and then turn them on. So, you know, theoretically, it's you know quite possible <laughs> that we hatch out a chicken that has a long tail, that has hands instead of wings, and it has teeth. And it's going to look pretty close to a velociraptor without doing much of anything else. I guess that's... Uh, <laughs> let me think about this. Um, yeah. Uh, how would one fund this? <laughs> but I guess you, a very wealthy individual could. Um, well, I don't think it's going to cost very much money to do that. I would say... I would say we could have a, a dino chicken with uh, just a couple of million dollars. Right. Definitely. Well, the soon. genome's out. And very G soon. Yeah. And I, yeah. I guess with chicken breeding, you know, you, you're always trying to expose uh, new sets of genes uh, for various phenotypes and, and shapes and sizes. So there's probably some kind of uh, registry for, for, for strains or not strains or sort of subspecies of chickens that have been... You know, my I, my cousin was in the 4-H club, and <laughs> he showed me some really funky chickens that he used to have. So that's pretty no, wild. There, are, there um, are funky chickens, yes. There are funky chickens, but none of them, you know, you're not, you don't see very, you know, they're not, we haven't selected for chickens with tails. And if we had, Kentucky Fried Chicken Guy would have got a hold of those. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, what about the the first? Let's let's go over some of the you know your your career of uh, hunting dinosaurs um, and and how it kind of helped um, our understanding of dinosaurs evolve or not evolve, but our understanding evolve, not the dinosaurs. Um, although maybe you could tell us a little bit about that too, dinosaur evolution. Um, so, you you found the first eggs in the Western Hemisphere. Was this in Montana? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Wow. Uh, a site we now know as Egg Mountain. It's a it's a site in western Montana where uh, where we first found some juvenile dinosaur remains, and then uh, as we looked around in that area, we soon found dinosaur eggs, and later we found embryos inside of those eggs. And this particular site, which we call Egg Mountain, is. Uh, is a very rich area for baby dinosaurs, nesting grounds, and, you know, really reveals, um, you know, what, what is possibly one of the best, you know, preserved ecosystems on Earth for, uh, for what these dinosaurs were like um, as living social creatures. I mean, we have their nesting grounds, we have individual nests with rims around them. We find the egg clutches in them. Sometimes we find the embryos inside the eggs. Sometimes we find clutches, um, nests that have baby dinosaurs in them, a whole group, like a little family of babies in there. Um, we're learning about how fast they grew. Um, we're finding evidence of gigantic herds of them. I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary. So you're finding dinosaurs, juvenile dinosaurs, near eggs? Or did, would these have been from the same no. cohort? Or are these from, like, 
Because if they're not from the same cohort, they're in a family, right? (laughs) But occasionally, when we find a nest with eggs in it, it is just a nest of eggs. Okay. And then, and then in a separate nest, maybe uh, you know a few feet away, we'll find maybe a, a a group of baby dinosaurs that succumbed to some something. But how, most of how, the nests, most of the nests were successful. So yeah, that would be pretty rare to find uh, a, a picture in time. How would how did how would that form? How would that start? If, is is there like a major catastrophic event that leads to like the flooding of a, a river uh, shore, or how how would you all of a sudden have uh, you know these various states of dinosaur life preserved? Or is it just such a rare well, event, but there's enough of rare events that you can find them? Well, in, in this particular case, um, you know, dinosaurs are nesting on the ground. They're not, you know, like birds nesting in a tree. So they're on the ground and, and they're, you know, they're, they're nesting relatively near a river. You know, mm-hmm. people build okay. people build their houses along rivers, and they get flooded as well. So, so the flood event would not be you know an extraordinary extraordinary event, but but uh, you know it's just like a like like we see colonial birds today. Um, oftentimes, something will happen to the parent, and the babies, oh. if they're nest bound, if they're altricial, and they're not going to leave. They will just stay there and starve to death. They are not going to get out of the nest to go anywhere. So, mm-hmm. if they're abandoned, they will die, and they will. And then, if there's a flood, they'll be covered up. And that's really all it takes to, you know, to preserve babies. But babies are very rare, which means it didn't happen very often. Um, I guess Eggs. well, babies would get eaten, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Eggs, on the other hand, uh, clutches of eggs are actually relatively common, and that's true. You know, with, with modern modern birds as well. Okay, you know, it, it's, you certainly find clutch, clutches of eggs that hadn't hatched more often than you find babies that died in their nest, and it's lots of reasons for that. But but we also find a lot of eggs that. You know that hatch successfully. We find the remains of the eggs in the nest. Uh, we can tell that the babies hatched out and left and went about their business. Um, so, in these clutches around Egg Mountain, in the in the nests, uh, how big is Egg Mountain, and how how dense are the uh, the nests? Well, the Egg Mountain is a site that is uh, I don't know maybe. The ex the excavated part so far is about well maybe a hundred feet by fifty feet, and we find clutches of of uh, eggs or remnants of nests about every um, uh, about every six to eight feet. Wow! Uh, and so they're you know it's colonial nesting and it's and it's pretty you know they're pretty tightly packed in there. Um, and we've gotten lots of, you know, th- this is a nesting ground of a meat-eating dinosaur called Troodon, which is very closely related to birds. How big is it? Uh, about eight feet long. Eight feet. Is it yeah. um, bipedal or is it... Uh, yes, bi- bipedal. Yep. Are, are all the bipedal uh, dinosaurs meat-eaters? No. No, uh, a lot of bipedal dinosaurs, like duckbill dinosaurs, oh, sure. are plant eaters. Um, so there's quite a number of bipedal plant eaters as well. Have you found any um, adult uh, around the 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 uh, the nests of on Egg Mountain? Have you found any adult uh, troodons? No. no, we haven't. But you know, even if you go to a modern day bird colony, um, it's very rare to find. Um, adult birds that have died on a nesting ground. They usually die elsewhere. So you, you know that there are troodons from the babies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just because then the babies, well, then, 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 then I, I guess it, you enter a huge debate. Are they troodons? And 
I guess, are the babies so similar to the adults? Are they really unquestionably troodons? The teeth of troodon are very, are unmistaking. I mean, they're, they're very peculiar teeth and the juveniles and adults' uh, teeth are identical. But that is, a, that is a problem with some other dinosaurs. We, we do have a hard time distinguishing the adults um, of a particular species based on juveniles. The juvenile um, skulls look very different than the adults. So, and that is one of my, you know, that's one of the things I'm currently working on right now. And, and we're discovering that you know, a lot of people have named a lot of species of dinosaurs based on the fact that the juveniles do look different than the adults. Well, <laughs> so uh, how many dinosaurs have been discovered? Cause, and is there a catalog that we can go uh, find online that sort of gets us through all of them? Or is there like a Wikipedia page for... <laughs> well, I, I suspect there is. I haven't looked at it, but I, I'm sure... I'm sure that on Wikipedia you can find uh, there. I think there's been a, around <laughs> eight or nine hundred of them named. Wow. Um, so it, I'm just I'm still I'm just amazed, right? Uh, it, it's I uh, consider myself lucky for being able to do what I get to do, and but to go out there into the field and actually walk with the dinosaurs is a uh, is a pretty amazing, um, uh, you, you know. <sighs> Feet. It's, it's just an amazing thing to do. Um, so, no, it's certainly fun. It's a lot of fun <laughs> to be out with the dead dinosaurs. But on the other hand, you know, it's kind of fun to hang around the uh, animatronic dinosaurs that we created in Jurassic Park, too. Um, we'll, we'll get to that in, in a little bit. I'm still, you know, how, how do, uh, there's so many questions about how, how do you understand, how do you work out their behavior, for example? But I'm still perplexed at how you you can um, get an understanding of what the the dinosaurs, which dinosaurs they are from their bones. Um, perhaps let's start there. How do you know what kind of dinosaur it is? What's the first step? You dig it out of the ground. I guess you, if it's unclassified. Well, if it's a well, there's a lot of <laughs> uh, systematic. You dig up, okay, so you dig up a dinosaur and then you got. You know, if it's a pretty good skeleton, it at least has part of the skull so that you have some idea of what it is or what it's related to. Um, if you think you might have a new one, then you have, then there's a couple of things you have to do. You first have to compare it to things that it might be related to to see if it is close enough to another one that it might be the same one and just might be, you know, individual variation. There's also the possibility that uh, it's an ontogenetic stage. In other words, a younger individual that doesn't look, you know, like the adult. So you've got to determine it's what we call ontogeny. It's growth stage. Um, and then, you know, you might have something that looks pretty darn close to something that you already have, but then find out that, you know, that it, it's at a different point in time. So, you know, more primitive or more derived. So, I mean, there's a lot of things you have to determine in order to figure out whether you actually have a new species or not. But, uh, you know, people can, like... Can you age them? Because what if you, I mean, yes. in, in, in our time, you know, a year is a huge amount of time. But if you're, you're digging up dinosaurs and you get one that's 75 million years ago and then, you know, 20 feet later you get one that, or further, you get one that's uh, 85 million years ago. 10 million years is a huge uh, time for evolution to happen, right? Yes, it so, is. And those colonies, yes. colonial dinosaurs aren't there for 10 million years or are they? No, they're not. <laughs> so you're, the morphology's dra changed dramatically. Humans 10 million years ago, well. Yeah. yeah and, and in fact, we have, we, we can resolve down to a million years or so. And, and, you know, we're seeing changes over a million to a million and a half years in dinosaurs. So, yes, that makes have a we, difference. Have we exhausted every... So I guess once you, you get your, your registry of all the possible uh, organisms that, you know, dinosaurs or if you're especially interested in, uh, you know, the, the reptilian uh, 
class. I, I don't know how, how you'd go about it. It's, it's such a big question here. Um, I because mean, there's mammals, there's arthropods, there's insects, there's trees, there's uh, we're there's never fish. We're never going to find them all. Right, we're never but, going to find them all. And it's so is the picture of our past of 200 million years ago just a small glimpse of what we could really imagine exactly. or exactly it is a tiny glimpse in fact let me just give you a perspective sure if you go out in ohio <laughs> you go out wander <laughs> around ohio and look at the places where a flood could actually cover up anything and likely keep it covered for a million years in other words where in Ohio do you have a depositional environment that's going to be preserved? Not likely anywhere. And that's true in Montana, and that's true in virtually all of the United States, except possibly down in southern Louisiana. Now, right. so, so we're looking, so basically all of North America right now is not going to preserve. So everything that's alive today is probably not going to preserve in our fossil record. We have a fossil record of the Pleistocene during the Ice Age because there was so much sediment that the, you know, the glaciers were producing so much sediment and dumping it into the rivers. And, and, and so we have that preserved, but we're not going to get much right now and we, we're not going to get much you know, in the next... You know, half a million years, so at least. So, so our fossil record is a tiny, tiny window on the past. I mean, we just have tiny little snapshots scattered through millions and millions of years. Well, maybe I could imagine in North America, some northern Alberta in the, near the tar sands, if an animal dies there, there could... That could be a good spot for, you know, modern deposition of bones or in the, in a lake bed, right? Because uh, lakes evolve themselves through, it. they they become, uh, they start off very oligotrophic, which means really crystal clear water. Then they, they so become older lakes with more weeds and more uh, biological deposits until the point where the sediment just overwhelms. But I guess the water is a really good place for, for bones to just... <laughs> that, that's, that's very that's very true. But you, what you have to realize is that the continent is doing things, and it has more to do with the continent than it does with the lake. The lake can you can do, you something can die in the lake, and it can be covered up, and the lake can completely fill up with sediment. But if the Rocky Mountains or or the Appalachians lift by just you know a foot over a million years. Yep. That lake sediment's probably going to weather away. It's going to erode right out of there. It'll be gone. Okay. So we're looking at a very small section of the, the biological diversity that's uh, out there. N nevertheless, there's a, it's tremendous. Uh, you just walk down the, to the Cleveland National, uh, Muse uh, Natural History Museum, and I mean, it's just amazing what they have in that one. Um, and it must yep. be fantastic at the Rocky uh, Museum of the Rockies. Well, we certainly have a lot of stuff here. <laughs> do, you, do you guys do any Cub Scout uh, camping in the uh, under the dinosaurs or with the dinosaurs? That's a sidetrack. Yeah, yeah, I think the the education department has sleepovers. Yeah. <laughs> a night at the <laughs> a, a night at the museum. He would love it. <laughs> um, so, with that in mind, how do you extend that to dinosaur uh, behavior and physiology? Or could you, and could you give us an example of some, some work that has led to a better understanding of behavior and physiology? Because they go kind of hand in hand. Well, before we found Egg Mountain and the, the nesting grounds of Myasora that are near Egg Mountain, you know, people assumed that, rep, that dinosaurs were reptiles and reptiles just abandon their eggs. You know, they lay their eggs and they walk away from them. Um, but what we discovered was, you know, we found the baby dinosaurs in the nests and we found eggs and we found um, the nests close to one another indicating colonial nesting. So basically, you know, from this one site, we discovered that dinosaurs cared for their young, that they nested in colonies uh, and they took care of their young until they were at least a year old. And then... Uh, then they traveled in gigantic herds 
of you know fifteen to fifty thousand individuals, and we learned all that from one site. So um, that's, that's amazing. behavior. That's behavior. <laughs> so 15, now you know from wow. the same animals, from the same animals, the same the same bones, basically. By looking at the growth rate, I mean, by actually taking those bones and cutting them open and looking at their internal structures, the bone histology, we're able to determine growth rates. And growth rates have to do with metabolism, and metabolism has to do with physiology. So what we discovered was that these dinosaurs hatched out of their eggs about 16 inches long and grew to nine feet the first year. And that kind of growth rate is, you know, equal to to uh, birds, extremely high metabolism, suggesting that dinosaurs were endotherms, that they were warm-blooded. Wow. <laughs> so that's uh, till nine feet long and weighing how much? Uh, you know, uh, probably 150 pounds, something like that. And consuming enormous amounts of uh, food. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, Dinosaurs are related to birds, and if you've ever watched birds, unless they're feeding their young when they go out and get food for, you know, four or five babies, they don't really eat very much. You know, we have the saying, eat like a bird. Birds don't eat very much. They, they could process food a lot differently than I. I mean, think of, you know, think of a cow. A cow goes out, it eats some grass, it chews it, it swallows it, goes through a stomach, it regurgitates it, it chews it again, it swallows it again, it goes through another stomach, comes out the back, and you can still tell it ate grass. Exactly. Whereas a bird, whereas a bird eats worms or it eats berries or it eats anything, and it comes out a little white spot. Or a big white spot. <laughs> big white Depends spot. The bird. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that the dinosaurs probably didn't have to eat very much. And, the, and you know, the reason is very simple. Mammals like ourselves, our ancestors evolved as nocturnal creatures. And in a nocturnal world, you have to generate heat and keep a constant body temperature. Otherwise, you're going to freeze to death. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are diurnal animals. They've evolved as diurnal animals, so they can utilize the sun. So we think that they are endothermic heterotherms, which basically means they generate heat internally just like we do, but they have a better regulation system. So think about it like this. If we drop, if we fluctuate our temperature by four degrees, we have to go to the hospital. A bird can fluctuate their temperature by 30 degrees and they're just fine. Really? I didn't know so, that. So, you know, just like in your house, if it's warm out, you turn the heat down a little bit. You know, that's, you don't have to feed the fire. Therefore, you don't have to eat as much. With the super high metabolic rate as well, I mean, to, to maintain that, I, I guess there's some dinosaurs that have, does a, a triceratops have the same metabolic rate as a T-Rex, as a velociraptor? I mean, I guess there's a certain range as well. But what, well, what, what I'm sure the there is a range, the but, but pardon? What's the, what's the fastest dinosaur in terms of met metabolism? Or your we have no idea. We have no idea. What I would just, uh, you know, based on the bone histology, I would say a young dinosaur growing very fast. Could they, um, I mean, it, you know, we have uh, heat. We, our muscles are, can warm up pretty quick. And if we're getting chased, we can run pretty quick. Can a dinosaur, even in a cold environment, you know, shake it off and uh, speed up its, uh, its, its performance. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering. Of course. Birds okay. do. Sure. Certainly. Right. right. I gotta even, keep even an alligator can do that. That is, no, no. I, reptiles have, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I took plant physiology in, in college, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, and switched over well, into you know, stuff. Uh, right? What is it? It's a, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, there's a. Is it the skunk cabbage? That's a yeah. plant that that actually heats up a little. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, tuna, for example, if you look at their hemoglobin, 
uh, kind of uh, it's optimized for warmer uh, than the water. I mean, so it's a, it's also a warm blooded uh, organism. Um, so you, by looking at the bone growth rates, you're, you can determine uh, some physiological properties of the dinosaurs and stuff. That's, uh, yeah. how, what about the shape of the bones and um, are, are there some great examples of where you're looking at the size of the brain for and you know the skulls of those animals that are um you know colonial are they smarter than the ones that aren't uh have you is there have you found some behavioral patterns that correlate to uh skull size and and signs of intelligence because some birds are brilliant and can use tools well you know you're 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 kind of mammal centric when you start thinking about 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 brains <laughs> <laughs> brains because you know we we generally think that you know if your if your brain's not all in your head then, then there's something's wrong with you but you know there's nothing to say that bird's brain is all tied up in the skull either or or that of a dinosaur because we have enlarged ganglion in the pelvis of dinosaurs and that may actually help a little so so when you're measuring the brain to body ratio of a of a mammal versus a, a dinosaurian reptile then you need to take in consideration the entire length of the nerve cord um so and that goes for birds as well but when it comes to brains you know we don't know enough about our own brain to figure out whether size makes a difference um <laughs> yeah i suppose i suppose yeah, yeah. um do, have you well have you seen complex behaviors and how would you how would you figure those out besides well, we haven't you know, we haven't seen complex behaviors but we know that dinosaurs were very social and generally social animals are relatively smart uh the the dinosaurs with the biggest brains are the ones that are closest to birds, like Troodon and Velociraptor and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Uh, how about evolution and, and fossil history? Is there enough uh, connections between the dinosaurs? I know with, with the more modern um, fossils, uh, there's enough of them around to really piece together intermediates between species. H have you been able to um, find relatives in, 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 the, in the world of dinosaurs? Well, of course. Um, but what, I don't know what, exactly what you mean by relatives. I mean, we can, you know, evolution is about generations. In other words, you know, evolution evolution is be all of the changes that we see in evolution the biggest changes occur between one generation and the next there's nothing that happens you know beyond that so um, do we have every generation of every dinosaur that ever lived no just like we don't have every generation of every you know human being that ever lived uh, so you know we we can't we don't have a you know the human history down very well. We've got little snapshots along the way. Uh, same for dinosaurs. We've got you know dinosaurs we find in the Triassic period, some that we find in the Jurassic, some we find in the Cretaceous, and yes, we can tell who's more closely related than the other based on shared characteristics and get some idea of the family tree. But um, do we have all of the ancestors of every group? No, just like we don't with humans. L let me ask you, um, is, it, is there an absolute consensus on how, these, how they disappeared? I, I have no idea. You know, I really, you know, I just don't really, I don't care. I mean, I, <laughs> it just, that, that to me is like the least interesting question about dinosaurs there is i dinosaurs were the dominant land animal for 140 million years and those are those you know those are the extinct ones and now they're still a dominant animal as birds so so how you know how and why a few big clunky ones went extinct is to me is just <laughs> you know not, okay. not interesting at all 
let me reverse that. What's the most interesting question being asked by paleontologists today? Well, I, um, I don't know. There are the most. I, I'm work. I'm looking at dinosaur ontogenies, and so are my students. Looking at the changes that dinosaurs undergo as they grew up, um, and I think that's very interesting because it does say something about their complex social behaviors. Um, there's uh, a lot of things we can do by collecting la large samples of dinosaurs, looking at individual variation and 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 getting some idea of uh, of you know sort of the the ecology of these animals. Well, it must be really really hard, right? Because it requires a tremendous amount of uh, uh, very careful uh, you know uh, exploration in the field as you pull out these bones and stuff to try and to answer questions such as how did these creatures interact right uh, what kind of yeah. with the ontology how would you piece together the life history of, of right, so is the, the troodon that is your your main focus well tro i know i don't actually one of my former students works on troodon i i would say right now i'm looking at triceratops how does it sound? Perfect. It fixed it. Perfect. Right. So you were saying you're, you're interested in Triceratops right now? Well, that's the dinosaur that we've been collecting the most of. I, you know, in our business, I went out, I was interested in, in a duckbill dinosaur called Edmontosaurus. And I was, I was, I went out to the right place to find them, hoping Edmonton? that, <laughs> hoping that, hoping that I would get a whole bunch of them. And I, you know, found very few of them, but I found a bunch of Triceratops. So, you know. That's what I work on now. <laughs> How big are they? How big? Yeah, and if, if you're studying the, the, the fam sort of uh, the ontology. The, small, the smallest ones that we get, the skulls are about, oh, about a foot long. And the All largest right. ones, the skulls are about nine feet long. And that, how long does it take to get to nine feet? Well, we're trying to figure that out. That's where their <laughs> growth rate we have not figured out yet. They must be cute at one foot long. <laughs> that skull one foot long. So we're talking about a four or five foot uh, triceratops. Yeah, they're very cute. Big <laughs> eyes, short snout. Yep, they look, you know, they have cute features. <laughs> yeah, it, it could hurt you <laughs> if they're well, really they mad. Don't, they don't really have horns then, so. <laughs> oh, cool. I bet they still could hurt you with a big snap. I mean, I can imagine a snapping turtle, a large snapping turtle, how much damage it could do uh, if you really get uh, a young triceratops angry. <laughs> it could snap your, could snap your, snap your bones. <laughs> Possibly. Um, so, uh, that, that, let's let's. Um, I think we we. We're getting a good glimpse of what it's like to work as a paleontologist and sort of explore uh, the world of uh, dinosaurs. I'd like to ask a little bit about uh, what it was like um, and how you got involved uh, with Jurassic Park with uh, Steven Spielberg. How did how did that start? How did he, you know, come well, about? Because it's not in the well, news, right? When somebody's making a movie, it's uh, did he call <laughs> you up? Is it? Hi, I'm <laughs> Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yes, he did. But, but you have to realize that, that Michael Crichton wrote the book and mm -hmm. his character, Alan Grant, in the book is based on me. Right. So, <laughs> I figured. <laughs> so, so I guess it was... So I, I guess, you know, and in the movie, Alan Grant is based on my character as mm -hmm. well. He's from Montana and he, you know, does what I do. So, so I guess that's why he called me up. Oh, that's fantastic! And uh, so, how long did it take? Uh, how did how did I, I guess Crichton worked with you as well to uh, to put the story together with coherence, right? Did you read no. his manuscripts before he put them out and made sure that no. they, they? No, I met the first time I met Michael Crichton was in the limousine on the way to the premiere of the movie. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been quite amazing. You know, a scientist, somebody who's been, you know, working hard in the field, all of a sudden you're in the limelight with, uh, with the, you know, one of the top filmmakers of, of all time. Um, yeah, it was fun. And, and did you work with the animators? Um, did yes. you help work on the yes. script? What was, your, what was most of the time you spent with them? I mean, what, what, what well, did you spend most of your time on? That was the 
I was on the set whenever there were dinosaurs on the set, and I worked with uh, with the um, ILM to make you know to make the dinosaurs the computer graphics dinosaurs, and I also worked with Stan Winston um, in his little creature shop to uh, help make the uh, animatronic dinosaurs. And then I worked with Sam Neill so he could see what a paleontologist, you know, <laughs> was like. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. It must have been a, a, a crazy time. Um, well, look, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming to talk to us today. Um, I know this is a show called Futures in Biotech, and uh, we're now looking back, uh, you know, 150, 250 million years, and uh, it, it's it's it was just an amazing journey. So, uh, thank you very much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Um, I'd I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Jack Horner, who's a paleontologist at and curator at the Museum of the Rockies and professor at Montana State University. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our uh, producer, Eric Lanigan and uh, Bert McQuinn for handling the audio and video today uh, for uh, uh, over in Petaluma, California. I'd like to thank Leo Laporte, Lisa Cancel, Tony Wang, Frederick Louis, Mike Taylor, John Salinina, and uh, Ken Shepardson, k Shep, for all the work they do to make uh, futures, po futures in biotech possible. I'd also like to thank uh, Phil Peltier and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. If you guys have any uh, suggestions, give me a call or send me an email, sorry, at mark at twit.tv. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.